I'm Rich Painter. Some of you know me. Now, some of you don't. I'm N0RAP. I have history that goes back prior to the current version of the club. Uh, the previous incantation where it was attached with the Trilight's Monument Fire. Some of you may remember that. Some of you are new and won't know that. Um, so I've had a long history with TLM. I live in Black Forest. I was uh, burned out by the fire and have been sort of out of commission for four years and just now I've moved back to my rebuilt house. So I've been not as active in the club and some of the other amateur activities. So uh, hopefully I will be a little more active. What I want to talk today about is particularly the special communications unit and how it relates with where it is in the county infrastructure, uh, some history about races where it used to be organized in a different way and recent laws have changed that here in Colorado. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. I'm going to give a very high level briefing. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. So I'll let your questions drive some of this. My goal is to inform you about the communications unit with the hopes that some of you may be interested in participating with us, joining us. All right. A little bit of history, and then I'm going to talk about organization, some of our functions, uh, the kinds of radios we work with, uh, our training and education, and last but not least, membership, trying to get, get people to join. How many have heard of races? Yeah, most of them. It was organized back in 1952 after World War I, during, I'm sorry, World War II. After World, or during World War II, amateur radio service was shut down. I don't know how many of you knew that, um, but it was shut down for, um, let's call it espionage and security reasons. So after the war, government and amateur radio entities said, we need a mechanism to have this function even during war. And we can't just shut off the <coughs> So, uh, in 1952, Part 97, Section 407 came into being, which established the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. And it was designed at the time that if the president issued an order, normal amateur operations would cease and only those amateur operators, uh, I'll call it authorized through races, could operate, and only on certain frequencies. And so that's kind of where the, the uh, public safety, public uh, service aspect of amateur radio was formalized in uh, relationship to the government entities during emergencies and disasters. I've, I've placed a key, a key statement that comes right out of the law at the bottom. And this is why um, it has been set aside from normal amateur radio services such as ARIES, as most of you are familiar with ARIES, is this has to be associated with some kind of governmental entity, is how the law was structured. And there were even details that you could only, um, I'll call it practice, one hour a week and other kinds of restricted uses. Because this was a service ready and waiting for a presidential order to kick in to use it in exclusion to amateur radio. So this has some very strange history to it. The SCU's predecessor was attached to the sheriff's office, and it was organized around races. So it conformed with the government linkage. It was part of a government entity. It had restrictions on how often you could practice, rehearse, and so on. Um, 
around 2010, don't hold me to this, my, all my records were turned up in the fire and I was trying to use some of my recovered documents to figure out exactly when we switched from being the old organized races organization into what we call the SCU. That was done around 2010. And there were, were a number of reasons for this. And one primarily was the government entities, their primary communications is the digital trunk radio system. I'll talk briefly about that later. And therefore, that's not an amateur radio system. And only until that system and some of the other related systems dysfunctions in some way or is insufficient are the amateur radios needed. And so if we as a emergency response group only put the word amateur radio around us, we are excluding our use and assistance with the other radio facilities that the served agencies that we serve work with. So we broadened the group and changed it, its name to the Special Communications Unit while it was still under the Sheriff's Office with the idea that we would operate with both public safety radios and amateur radios. Then, uh, as you many know, there was a big upheaval with the change in sheriffs and the county commissioners changed a lot of the structure of where things fell under the sheriff's office or under the county. And so the Office of Emergency Management moved from under the sheriff's office to under the county. And along with that went the SCU. Some changes that affected how races functions happened last year by the governor signing this bill. And I've listed some pieces here. You can do a search with Google for Colorado 2016-10 uh, and read all the things. It's uh, uh, maybe 13 pages or something like that. But it changed how things work. In the past, racist was all out of the federal level. And I still don't understand, and if you guys understand this, you go tell me because I don't understand how the state can step in and says, no, now we're controlling races here in Colorado. But that's what this act did. It established an auxiliary emergency communications unit at the state level uh, uh, as part of, and it says right here, Division of Homeland Security Emergency Management and Department of Public Safety up in Denver. It's part of the, the, the state government. And all the races control is now done through that. So it's changed in a sense, and I don't understand who's in charge in a sense. Is it the way the president order functions with activating races? Or is it in conflict with that? Is it in concert with that? I don't know. It's hard to understand. But this changed how things were done. And uh, so to make it simple, we look to the state level emergency management operation passes, I'll call it orders if you wish, to the local level which would be county and the county has our organization underneath it and we get our orders that way. So it's sort of a chain of command. So uh, there's a formal document that the county has produced that says the Special Communications Unit is the duly authorized races organization. And all of these have to be done that way. You can't just say, I'm going to be racist. I'm going, you know, and I'm going to play into this space. It has to come through a governmental entity. So that, um, that was established uh, formally. And in fact, the formal letter was only signed this year. So this is like, takes forever to get this stuff done. And as part of that, there's what is referred to as the races officer. And in our organization, the director of our group is the races officer. The structure of our organization is uh, all bolted into the public works area. And so the public works director, uh, executive director Jim Reed reports to, I guess, the county commissioners, 
and, uh, loosely and an exe the county executive. I don't know exactly how they divvy that up, but he's in charge of public works. So that's roads and all the other things. If you go to the county website, you can see the details in the org chart. Um, I have one if you want to see it, um, but it's, I couldn't bolt it into my presentation, so I'd have to show you separately. Under uh, Reed is the Office of Emergency Management. And uh, the deputy chief is Lonnie Inzer, and Bart, and Bart Evans reports to Lonnie. And Bart is the emergency preparedness planner, and under that is where we fall as a chain of command. So our director, Fred Kendall, by the way, he's out there uh, in the SVU, uh, or SCU vehicle, SCUV, um, uh, playing with radios and getting that stuff set up. So he, as a chain of command, reports to Bart, and that's how we're structured in a sense from top down. <coughs> it's um, quite formalized in that sense, yes. Does Fred have an amateur radio call sign? Yes. I have it on another page. Okay. Oh. So does everybody see how this is organized? Again, it's connected to a governmental entity. And I, I'm, I'm painting this picture so that you can get an understanding of how it's very different in contrast to Aries, which many of you know, maybe some of you are very members. This mission statement's right out of our documentation. And basically, our primary mission is to support the, um, I'll call it the governmental entities in the South Central All Hazard region. I'm not gonna go into great details about that, but if somebody wants to talk about it, I can. The, the uh, federal state uh, organization for how emergency management is done, how hazards are and, and incidents are responded to are broken up into regions. And here in Colorado, we're part of the South Central region and that includes the fire departments, uh, police departments, uh, county OEMs, city OEM. Uh, it, it goes up to, you know, past um, Woodland Park. It's a pretty big section of the south end of the state. And, I, and there's maps that can show you all this stuff. Uh, so as part of this governmental entity, our primary mission is to interface with all these other folks. And when assistance is needed, they put in requests and we're mobilized or not, uh, depending on all the other factors. Now, generally speaking, if, as, you, as, you, uh, as you learn more about this, this organization, when playing in this space as a first responder, is generally up to three days maximum. Because most of the incidents that we're involved with, there is uh, state and federal resources that will come into play. Let's use Black Forest Fire or uh, Wallow Canyon Fire. We were activated and operated for several days as the other resources came in. And they then displace our function and we go back and on, you know, go back our, and get out and get, not be involved directly. They bring in teams from outside to do this. So uh, I've delineated here that ARIES uh, primary uh, served agencies are, are public service entities such as Red Cross and other, uh, uh, other localities. Sometimes they're involved with, uh, on the periphery, with us and others, but there's a distinction between that and the public safety entities, which we're part of. Here's the, a very important piece of this. Under the old system, when we were purely races, only amateur radio people could participate. But see, we also do a lot of things. We do communications in various ways, from video and public safety radios and so on. And so you don't necessarily need an amateur radio license to do those functions. So, we don't require an amateur radio license to be a part of the SCU because there's other things that we have to do. 
we encourage it, and I'll bet you nearly everybody has an amateur radio license. But that's a distinction uh, to function with us because it's not absolutely required. <coughs> Some of the things that we do, of course, is recruiting and training people. Recruiting is very difficult. And uh, part of it is that we are more formalized than some of the other organizations, let's contrast it with Aries, much less formality than, than, uh, than we are. And uh, we have, uh, I don't want to call it a time commitment, but to become familiar with all the equipment we use is beyond amateur radio. Operating the county radio systems and so on, it takes some time to learn to do that. Some people don't want to, they want to just be amateur radio. And so there's recruiting and training is, uh, is a big part of, of our challenges. Uh, we design and maintain the uh, Emergency Operations Center comm room and the vehicle out here, as well as uh, some portable equipment. We do radios, antennas, computers, software networks, phones, a variety of things. The Emergency Operations Center for the county is on Mark Dabbling. There's a, a bunch of soccer fields down there, if some of you know of that. And it's uh, on the uh, east side of Mark Dabbling, across from the soccer fields. Uh, the Hazmat Group is there, the Wildland Fire Group is there and the Emergency Operations Center and the Office of Emergency Management. It's all located in that building. There's some Sheriff's Office folks there too, okay? So the comm room is down there and there are lots of antennas up on the roof and we do the antenna work. Um, the mounting of the antenna is done by the county because they, they're very touchy about their rubber roof. So um, we get involved in this, but you know, there's certain things we don't get to do. We maintain, and as, as uh, Chip talked about, channel lists and frequencies and repeaters and so on. We maintain large lists of, of uh, operating frequency modes and so on. And we program all the radios except the county DTRS radios. And uh, the 800 megahertz trunking system, as you may know it. Uh, that's done uh, through a special office that manages that stuff. And we have a number of, of the 800 megahertz radios. We have some portables. Uh, and we also have some that uh, are in our van and also in the comm that, that we use. So the others, there are others such as uh, public safety VHF radios we program, as well as all the amateur radios we program. Most, if not all, of our VHF public safety radios, we program both with all the public safety frequencies, the national interoperability radio frequencies, and all our amateur frequencies and amateur repeaters. Because those radios will do both modes, and they're, they're type accepted to do both modes. Unlike amateur radios, if they're not type accepted to do the public safety frequencies, you really can't do that. Some of the Chinese radios are type accepted <coughs> public safety frequencies, just as a, an aside. And those of us who have them, like the Wuxons and Bay of Homes and so on, have programmed the, the public safety VHF frequencies into them. And when we're activated in some way, we're allowed to use them and operate under the licenses that go with the county and other entities that have them. All, of course, we respond to our served agency. The county will have us get involved in various functions from both emergencies, non-emergent activities, and exercise itself, as we would expect. We develop uh, standard operating procedures for a vehicle, our radios, and so on, and try to make things as cookbook as possible. We try to keep our frequency plans in all the radios in banks organized in the same way across different radio systems um, to help make it easier. And it's a difficult challenge. It's hard to do. Um, we do uh, training <coughs> exercises. Uh, we have 
to have special vehicle training to drive the county vehicle. And there's a handful of us that are, uh, are cleared to do that. Uh, Phoebe here, she's one of our members, she's one of them. She's also, she does dual duty. She also drives the Sheriff's Office Motown. So she's part of that group as well. We develop uh, the 205s. Now, if you're not involved in any of the MCOM world yet, um, the 205 is a standard radio plan that's used throughout all the emergency services. And so we have standard sets of plans that we have that have our, our repeaters, our VHF, our, uh, uh, our uh, VHF public safety as well as amateur. We have these all ready to go. We modify them if we need them on site for an event or emergency. So these are things we have to maintain. We have standardized on our digital amateur communication using FL Digi. And of course we use voice like, like everyone else. We have a video and we do D-Star, although our D-Star system's kind of lame right now. I hope to shortly get the, the, uh, the computer controller on Cheyenne Mountain back up there. It's working in my house right now. Uh, and we'll have that D-Star machine back, link, linkable to the rest on the trunk range. Uh, so we have D-Star radios in the comm room, D-Star radios here in the, in the comm truck as well. We function and operate under the NIMS, and NIMS is the National Incident Management System. And it evolved after a number of disasters over the last decades to have a unified way to deal with everyone from police, fire, ambulance, air, volunteer organizations, and so on. And so they use the Incident Command System, ICS, and it has uh, principles and practices and a lot of standardized forms. The 205 radio plan is one of them. So we live in that space. The radios, just to quickly go over this, uh, we have of course base, mobile, and handhelds. We use 800 megahertz uh, DTRS radios, but we do not program them, the county does that. Uh, we have VHF public safety radios. We also have, uh, and I can't remember what band it's on, we have a radio that we can talk to Fort Carson on, out in the truck. It's a uh, low band. Um, and or it's been in and out of the truck, so I can't be sure if it's still in there. Uh, but we have a lot of interoperability from that perspective. Of course, HF, uh, VHF, and UHF amateur radio, including a D-Star. We have public safety repeaters. We have uh, two repeaters. One's in the vehicle. It's uh, called VTAC-17. And as you, if you get interested and you get more involved with the uh, SU side of things, if you wish, versus ARIES, you get into all the national interoperable frequencies. And the VTAC 17 is an interoperable tactical VHF channel that's the same across everywhere in the country. And you can program repeaters to operate in this space, and we have one. So if we get activated to do something, we can set this repeater up and everybody's public safety radio has this in it, everyone's. Everyone's, police, fire, air. Uh, and so they can all, we can tell them to go to VTAC 17 and they, we can operate on that repeater. We also have a VTAC 34 repeater that's down at the common that we can fire up from there. Uh, the Cheyenne Mountain repeater 76, as people refer to it, is the SCU's um, repeater. It right now uses a CMRG call sign, but that's going to change. We're going to change it to one of our call signs, and I, I don't know which one, but it's probably EPC, I don't know, one. Who knows? We'll figure that out. Uh, since we own it, and, and, and uh, we, we have these club calls now. So those are our three club calls. One is for the comm room. We've sort of allocated them for purposes of communicating from one to the other with using different call signs. So once the comm room, one, uh, the MCP is the Sheriff's Office Mobile Command, we're called MOCOM. We have designated that as amateur radio station. And ESD is, um, is that the one? I think that's the one at the comm room. I get them mixed up. It's on, if you go out go in the vehicle, it's lit, written up on the wall there, so you can, you can see the delineation. 
Uh, we require uh, the ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800 courses. And ARIES asks you to do those same courses. Okay? They're FEMA uh, uh, web-based, self-directed, free, and they have a lot of other courses. And, and you know, if, if you like, you can learn a lot about the system by taking other courses. I've taken many of them. We encourage certifications, and this is in the all hazards, as I talked to you earlier about, we're in the South Central All Hazard region. Uh, the All Hazard system has radio. Oh, I've got a typo. I'm sorry. That's uh, C O M T. That's supposed to be Com T for Communications Technician, and Com L is a Communications Leader. Um, those are certifications you can go and and take. Uh, we educate people on how to operate our comm room, and we're briefed and are involved at times with the actual EOC operations. Sometimes we'll assist them. Most of the time, it's for our doing communications and message handling. Uh, we train on the vehicle, and uh, of course, radio operation. Most people know the ham radio side pretty well, so we train on the trunk radio system, how to use it. Do not push the red or orange button, okay? That's rule number one. Don't push the red button. We have uh, periodic exercises, demos, presentations at our monthly meeting and things like that. Here's some membership requirements. Because this is a county volunteer, it requires an age. So the youngest folks are not able to participate. Uh, it's managed as a county volunteer. If any of you are already county volunteers, you know that process. Uh, you would apply through our volunteer coordinator, and then you have to be cleared through a statewide system that has come into being in the last year or so, called the Colorado Volunteer Mobilizer. And they do background checks. Yes, since we're connected to the county operations, that has to be done. Uh, you get special badges from the Colorado Volunteer Mobilizer. I actually have three, and they're done by specialties. So if you have a specialty that they want to know about, they create separate badges for these things. So I have a radio operator, amateur radio operator. I'm a professionally licensed engineer, electrical engineer. They have separate categories. If you were a doctor, they want to know. They have doctor badges and so on. This code here has all my credential data in it. I can go to any incident within the state. They scan this and they know who I am and what my skill sets are based on this system. So it's a move to try to gain a better interoperable way to have volunteers participate with the professionals and be able to credential them. Should they be on this scene? Should they not be and all that? It's more formalized, as you can see, in contrasting with Aries. Uh, you, then you get a county ID badge. So there's a county ID badge. They're changing this, so this is old. This, like, somebody, one of our guys here has one already. He's out in the truck, I think. So I have the older style. Uh, we have monthly meetings, like most of our organizations. Uh, we have work bees that are Wednesday mornings. And radio net, we do events like this, and uh, of course respond to uh, actual emergencies. We do participate in some exercises. Uh, the last formal one I think was when we had the, the deep freeze operation, deep freeze, which was centered up here, and it was using military and all a variety of entities. We were participating as as, uh, as part of that. So if you have interest or even questions, uh, Fred Kendall, who's out in the truck, there's his call sign and his email address. And send him an email, tell him you're interested, and we'll get you connected to the right people or brief you more on things. <coughs> and of course, I'm Rich, and there's my address. Please uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions or I covered this from 10,000 feet, so um, if anybody has any 1,000 foot questions, you know, feel free. 
Yeah, so, I mean, from a, maybe think, think about a newer ham that uh, hasn't been around this stuff before. If they got involved in SCU, what, what kind of activities, what does a year with SCU look like? You might speak in terms of when things are sort of quiet, yeah. not a lot going on versus there's the next Black Forest fire where things get really yeah. hot and heavy, no pun intended. Yeah, um, the actual crap hits the fan stuff, as we all know, we've had a few, but they don't happen too often, thank goodness. Um, we're always involved with that in the first couple of days. So that entails a variety of things. It entails writing, making 205s for the incidents, providing uh, uh, some radio and comp traffic management, mostly public safety, unless there needs to be amateur radio components, which we have at times, pull that into play. So it's a mix of things. During the non-emergent times, it's um, doing typical things that you might expect. We are, I can't remember how long we've been doing this, we've been doing it for so long, the um, ascent and marathon. We do the central comms for that, and that's managed and organized um, by uh, the, uh, oh gosh, I'm losing my Search mind. and rescue. Search and rescue, thank you. Who's the rescue guy? Search and rescue, okay? Those people are a separate entity organizationally, but have a memorandum, memorandum of understanding through the sheriff's office, and they get their authority through <coughs> and they're allowed to say El Paso County, you know, search and rescue. They need their people on the radios to do their health and welfare management of the mountain. And so we set up and we monitor the search and rescue, we pass messages, we log uh, activities, and in fact, the last couple of years we use Google. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is we provide internet service through the, the vehicle, and so we will have uh, a Google Doc and share that with people who are geographically all over the place. That's a real-time spreadsheet. Now, I don't know if anybody's used Google Docs, but I bring it up. I put a runner, a runner uh, uh, bib number in and uh, injury at so-and-so, mile marker, or whatever. Instantly, all the people sitting there on their internet connections, part of the race and search and rescue, get that information instantly. It's not a message being sent, it's a shared doc. So we'll do some of that management of information and communications for the Pikes Peak uh, Sent Marathon is, a, is one of the examples. To answer the question, what would a new ham get out of it? Uh, an opportunity to understand public service, get to play with lots of cool toys, get to see how complicated um, just exercises and public services. We, we interact with search and rescue, CERT, um, the sheriff's office. Uh, we can also be called by other counties in the Southern Colorado district. I'm not anywhere near technically inclined like Rich is. I don't go home and play with all kinds of cool things. I just, you know, I just want to um, You're an operator. be able to help. Sometimes you just need a warm body. You need a voice. Uh, one of the complaints that some of the guys complained about that I guess have a little more pride than I do was that during the very first Waldo Canyon fire they ended up doing nothing but holding the door open for people going in and out of the emergency services division because it has a, a I can tell that fire. story because that was me. Yeah, and so the idea being that today we have people like Tom Gill who pushes to do exercises so we drive the van out to different places people sit in the emergency operations center radio room and we see if we can talk back and forth. We play with the different toys. You get exposed to all, you know, the beauty of amateur radio is, is we got way too many toys we can play with. We can do satellite, we can do digital, we can do uh, two meter, we can do 440. You know, which radio should I buy? Oh my gosh, you know, you can go, um, it can be overwhelming for a new person to go, what on earth are they talking about? 
The fun thing about the SU is that we have people that have been through actual Waldo Canyon Black Forest fires, have seen an incident one. You know, when I first got into amateur radio uh, uh, in Bryan, Texas and in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Aries was it. And Racy's was something that was pulled from Aries should there ever be a big inc incident. A lot of my buddies went off to help Katrina because they actually reestablished a lot of communications. Um, a lot of my buddies went over to East Texas when the shuttle came down because in the Piney Woods, the law enforcement's cell phones were not functioning. So we had amateur radios. And, and most of you have watched some of the stuff or have heard the stories of all the amazing things that, that um, Aries and uh, SCU and, and MOCOM did for the, the fires and helping the Incident 1 commanders bring it all together. We have just a few more toys in that we have the public um, radios and uh, the both the SCV and the MOCOM can be stood up such the MOCOM actually has the tape encrypted radios. That's the only difference. Otherwise it has the public service. It has ways to get to search and rescue. It has, you know, most importantly, when I sat in the uh, emergency operations center in San Antonio and they described an FBI exercise done in San Antonio, a panel van drove up next to the police station where the main communications antennas were. It blew up and took out, you know, this was their scenario. It blew up and took out that. And then it was also on the day that they were having a parade. You know, they set this whole thing up. They, they picked everything that could go wrong in San Antonio. And while I was sitting there, I was going, well, you know, you got to take care of people, you got to do this, you know, I'm running that through my head. Yeah, no. Uh, playing these games, doing the exercises, means that when Black Forest and Waldo Canyon came, a lot of times we didn't really care if you had a license or whatever, we had something for you to do. You know, and maybe nothing more than picking up the cell phone and taking the logistics officer's request for the local catering company to bring a certain fire unit their food. You know, there get to be so many different details and logistics that, you know, being part of SCU means you get to be right in the middle of it and see what's going on. And if you come, you know, become part of, of the group, you get to see what all these different things are and you come, become much more aware of what really went on during, you know, Black Forest of Waldo Canyon and how amazing it is how all these people come out and try and help take care of each other. You know, I thought I knew what law enforcement did, but then I went through the Sheriff's uh, Citizens Academy. Yeah, no, watching TV and, you know, reading newspaper things about stuff like that, you think you know what law enforcement does? No, the Citizens Academy is a six-week course. Absolutely amazed about the men and women who provide our, our PD, our fire, our, um, you know, sheriff's thing. And you, you know, I, I always said this about teachers. It's like I could never be a teacher because I killed little monsters. You know, it, same same thing with the sheriff's office. Their compassion, and their empathy for people astounds me. You know, I just think they deserve to be shot. But uh, you know, it's unbelievable. The fun thing about amateur radio is you don't have to go all the way to that type of a calling in your life. You simply need to come play with the radios, have fun. If you like cool toys, you like to, you know, have the possibility that you might actually be able to help your neighbors and friends by joining public service, then uh, SEU lets you, you see search rescue, search sheriff's office, you know, lets you see a lot of that. You know, you may find that, as my husband was teasing, he, he thinks he wants to go join the fire rehab group because he thinks that'd be fun to sit around a barbecue for all the firefighters, you know, and help them out. You know, sometimes whatever you're Whichever you like, whatever your skill set is, that's why we love amateur radio. Maybe I don't care to be an HF contester and learn how to do 50 words a minute CW. Um, you know, I'm incompetent at that. But man, I can talk all day and, and tell people how to find stuff, where to go, you know, what's going on. You know, hey, come up here and listen to some of these lectures. So for a new person, SCU lets you get exposure to a lot of things, and we got a really cool truck to play with. One of the uh, hit home examples is for the 4th of July, the, the truck's going to be up and part of the uh, uh, communications role up there. And I don't know exactly yet what the detail of, of that is going to be, but it's going to be on the uh, public safety side, I believe. 
Now, we've got amateur radio in there, so we'll be able to monitor and, and or message pass between that and your amateur radio networks you've got. But there's another example where um, we're asked to go out. It's available. It gets scheduled. It's done. It's on a <coughs> planned basis, so it's not emergent. And uh, those are, are the kinds of things that we've done. We have had other events that come and go, uh, races and other types of things, uh, where we'll participate and provide contributions <coughs> for. Did I answer? Did did, did uh, we answer your question well enough? You did. That was a, great. a rough idea. Most of the time, it's practicing and events, and once in a while, it's a crap at the fan. Uh, we were first, well, I, I will tell you the story. It was field day for Waldo <laughs> Canyon. Everybody remember that? I was at Mike Skinner's house, Mike's out here today, in Monument. And we were getting set up for uh, field day. On the way up, I went from Black Forest, Swan, and Balmer, where I live, and I'm going across Hodge, and I go, what is this big column of smoke? Bill. This doesn't look right. I've heard nothing on anything about it. <laughs> so we started doing setup at Mike's, and then we got a phone call. And it was our leader at the time was Jim Vogie. He was in Denver, highly accessible, and said, crap hit the fan, all hands on deck down at the EOC. Now the EOC at that time was down off Castilia. I was mobile. I had everything with me in my truck. And so in it, I said, I can leave. I don't even have to put stuff away. You're, you know, it's your house. I hopped in the truck and went down there. And the first thing I went in, the incident, or uh, the, uh, the manager of the EOC said, go hold the door for people coming. Because there's a lot of people who are not part of FIRE, not part of SCU, for example who are other people associated with functions around the county and city <coughs> that have to come to the EOC and participate. That they don't have door access and so on. They're only there in an emergency. And so somebody had to be out there. So I got sent out there and I'm thinking, I'm the wrong guy to do this because I'm the tech guy that's got to do all this other stuff early on. Yeah, that quickly passed. And I was within five minutes told to take this vehicle out here, this communications truck, up to Green Mountain Falls and set it up. And so I was, I was, I went up and I set that up. And the, it's the first response, if you wish, from the communications and the incident command. And we set that up and started the incident command. One of the first things I did was provide internet to the state patrol. Um, to our incident commander, uh, to the Forest Service. We were set up in a place they didn't have internet and I made that available for them. Gives you an example of some of the things we, we do, right? I was there till late that night and then somebody brought me back uh, that was coming back down the hill kind of thing. So you get the idea of the response. Um, we were set up for Black Forest Fire. I was out of town and in Winter Park when that happened. And I got the call and I said, all right, we're coming back. And I mean, it's a long story, but basically by 7.30 that night, I was at the incident. I had credentials, I came through all the roadblocks. I came right to the command post and I got to work and I worked around the clock until two o'clock the next day doing everything you can imagine from interfacing with the Air Force commands comp truck that came down from Wyoming, bringing networking, higher speed, more bandwidth networking to the rest of us, to uh, cooling fans on equipment that's overheating, uh, programming radios. The second day, I programmed the Forest Service radios. They bring the Forest Service teams come in from out of town, and they need these radios set on just the frequencies you're gonna use it. So there's a line of people with radios, I'm cloning radios and handing them out like this. And then after a few, after about a day and a half, the, the other 
professional call, the professional teams come in and say, okay, you're relieved. So that's kind of how one of those incidents might go. You don't operate that way in airy space. It's different, as you can see. We're more in, in uh, coordination and cooperation with the, uh, the public safety entities. So that was an example. While I was doing this, my house burned to the ground. Right there at that time when I was there at the command post doing my thing, my house got incinerated with many others. It's kind of a weird thing when you think about it. It's something I've struggled with, but um, it's what we do and uh, it's how we do it. You wouldn't have been allowed in to save it anyway. So, anybody have other questions? Well, appreciate your attention and time today and, uh, and make sure you go out and spend a little time in the comp truck out there ask questions look at radios uh, they're going to be if the antennas are finalized they're going to be contesting like the rest are out there they got to share somehow we've got to pass a token around for sharing bands but um, he wants us here to they're uh, they're ready to rock out there they can show you the other radios the trunking radios and so on out there too. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, take a short break. Yeah. Uh, our next presentation is at 1130. Stu is going to talk about dry training for radio operation. Hopefully there's some newbies that want to try out the HF radio ball or something. Stretch material already well, I've, uh, sourced out or something. Well, I had it sourced out. I'm just hemming and hawing along to get the right side. Right. And I need to, need to finish figuring it out. But then there's always something that comes up. Like, have the roof done? That's that's done. Uh, just uh, being a working stiff. There's not enough hours in a day. You need to retire. You four and a half years. Yeah. 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 Yeah.